Hello and welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, cheercharge.co.uk. Great tasting flapjack chia bars. You can use the code COT10 for 10% off. Precisionhydration.com. Leaders in triathlete sweat testing and hydration with multi strength electrolytes that match how you sweat. There's a 15% off product code with Cup of Tri 15. And Team Oxygen Addict. Online triathlon coaching with host Rob Wilby. Rob, hello. Hello, Helen, and also a shout out to our patrons. Thanks very much for everyone who supports the show. And hello, Helen, how are you? I'm I'm very well, thank you, Rob. I was out on my bike yesterday in the sunshine, and I went. I, I just rode up alongside someone, and I said, "Oh my goodness, how amazing is this?" I was sweating my backside off. It was boiling. <laughs> It was warm, wasn't it, yesterday? I, I went down to just like a t-shirt. Yeah, I can believe it. it was, uh, I think we're seeing the end of the weather now, though, mate. I think I think the summer is over. It's not June anymore, is it? First no. of November. But I, I just sort of, I thought yesterday, I was in one of those, I was like, I, I probably shouldn't go on my bike because actually my legs hurt a little bit. But I don't think I'm going to get many more of these days. So I'm just going out for a couple of hours and, oh, I loved it. It was one of those, mm. I'm out in the countryside, there's blue skies, there's green fields, I've, I've ridden a little bit up <laughs> towards, the nice. edge of, towards the edge of the Peak District, and, and when you look out and you kind of think, oh yeah, this is okay. Feeling the joys of spring, were you? Feeling the joys of autumn. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, if you can hold on to that feeling, when you really enjoy doing it and training, isn't it a grind? That's the key, isn't it? You've got to find a way to bottle that feeling right there. Totally. So that'll, that'll be keeping me through going through winter, Rob. I'll be thinking, oh, I'll get this view again in a few months' time. Yeah, you will. <laughs> Who knows? Get... Maybe we'll have a few more nice weeks yet. You never know. Maybe we're not into the deep, deepest of winter yet. I don't huh? think we are yet, but um, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that there will be the odd bike ride in a, in a little bit of sunshine. You know I'm such a fair weather blooming rider, aren't I? <laughs> Spot of rain, yeah. I'm like, nope. <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> Get me on that turbo. Um, Rob, on the show today, we catch up with Lucy Gossage because we mentioned last week she is not retiring, but she has gone back to work. Oh, cool. Yeah, back to her job as a as a cancer doctor. So, wow, it's that feeling when, I don't know if you've been travelling for a while or you just haven't been at work for a while and then or the old going back to school... But imagine two years out of that and then having to go back. It would be pretty difficult, like exciting, but difficult. Yeah, two years out of work and back to it. Yeah. Do you know what? I wonder whether it'll actually refresh her. It'll refresh her sort of triathloning. I think it will. Having a different focus three days a week. And then because she's still got that massive, massive training base, she's still super talented. And she's going to get back into it with a different focus because she's got to fit in something else three days a week. So. I, I think we haven't seen the best of Lucy yet, you know. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'm totally with you. So we do chat a little bit about that and sort of work-life balance again and, you know, what she's looking forward to, what she enjoyed as a full-time professional athlete. Because obviously she did mix both mm. for a couple of seasons, didn't she? Um, Good, yeah. And then chose to take a two-year sabbatical. Um, and now, yeah, she's going back to do some work but still race as well as a pro so yeah it will be really cool to see how she gets on and actually whether that balance yeah as you say will you know she's not going to lose anything from going back to work well yeah exactly you said it mate you said it right so we've got an interview with lucy later on today so shall we uh should we go through some results of what's been going on around the world this weekend yes and i think we should start off in the caribbean rob Okay, so our results are sponsored by Precision Hydration. Anyone who's uh, interested in getting some goodies from them, you can use the code Cup of Try 15 Anybody ordering in October gets entered into a prize draw. So by the time this comes out, October's over, isn't it? So we'll be announcing our winner of the free sweat test, hopefully next week or the week after. Um, they've got some great performance blogs over there at the minute as well, Hells, that you need to get over there and check out. I mentioned Andy Sloan's one about qualifying for Kona at Ironman Wales last week, but... They're putting some really good content up there as well. So it's not like marketing content. It's just really genuinely interesting stuff from athletes that they sponsor. So good work from the guys over at Precision Hydration. Fantastic. I need to get rid- I need to um, 
get onto that blog and have a little read. I will do that after this, Rob. Could have done with a little bit of hydration over in the Caribbean this weekend, I reckon. <laughs> it's look... there. Seamless link. I like it. I like it. It looks pretty. Uh, they call it like pain in paradise. It looks absolutely stunning. Palm trees everywhere, and you know that gorgeous kind of turquoisey water. Um, but you are literally up against the world's best um, for a nice little sixty thousand dollar top prize. So it's one to definitely. That's almost as much as the money at Kona, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Kona hundred grand. I think still. so. Yeah. That's a nice little workout for being in the Caribbean for, for the weekend, isn't it? Three days, yeah. So it's like a stage race format. Um, and the final day, whether you start that or not, depends on sort of the deficit in the general category. Um, yeah. And then the ones who win overall are the ones who cross the line first. So it sounds like a really cool racing format. Um, and... It going into the final day on the men's side of things um, Richard Murray of South Africa started with like a, a minute and five lead um, over Cameron Dye of America and he had 113 on Terenzo Bazzoni of New Zealand um, but then it was a bit of like jostling between Cam Dye and Murray on the bike because Cam Dye caught up but then uh, Murray ran off with it so Richard Murray won in 3.35.35, like a total time. Cam Dye was second of the USA in 3.36, and then Aaron Royal of Australia, third in 3.38. So, so that's like over three days, huh? Yeah, so they, yeah, over three days, and it just sounds... Imagine sounds trying cool. to race a sprint after having two two races in your legs I know. <laughs> this already. Is it. And, and, and it's sort of like... <laughs> brutal brutal kind of racing isn't it yeah it really is um, so on, Full the, on. on the women's side Gwen Jorgensen won for a second year running to just show that she is Mrs. Dominating um, <laughs> it's kind of cool isn't it that she can go from you know Rio taking top spot in Rio then I think she probably had a little bit of a break and then she come back for the Island House um, Invitational and um, yeah. yeah so she did have a 45 second lead on Holly Lawrence and 55 seconds on Flora Duffy um, but then I think Duffy and Lawrence were like working together on the on the first bit of the swim and then Duffy caught Jorgensen halfway through the bike but then um, Jorgensen took the lead again at 3k into that final 5k run so in the end it finished with Gwen Jorgensen winning in a total time of 3.55.01 Flora Duffy second in 3.55.19 and then Holly Lawrence third in 3.56.17 Nice way to end the season I reckon a bit of a paycheck and get into racing the Caribbean I think so and it was funny because I, I saw um, Holly Lawrence on Twitter just put something like ouch <laughs> Yeah so you've got to imagine a few people are that they're hanging on aren't they for the end of the season come, come the end of October people's racing has been over for a while so, yeah, tough one, I reckon. Tough I one to so. stay in shape for. And so they kind of then they have like a time trial bits of it. They have like an enduro race, and then they have those start times based on the general like standings for the third day. So it's kind of like this fair way of racing, isn't it? And to bring yeah. everyone together from drafting and non-drafting, um, it's kind of cool. Yeah, very cool indeed. All right, shall we move over to uh, Austin 70.3 next? Yep, which turned into not a 70.3. It did. Sounds like they had the same kind of fog that we had a couple of days ago over there, huh? Yeah, yeah. they uh, they had to cancel the swim because it just looks like a... Well, you can't really see anything. Those, it, pea it looks good. I think that's yeah, pea phrase. soup. And, and good, it looks like um, good weather for Halloween, Rob. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You said it. So cancelled swim, 56-mile bike, and a 13.1-mile run. Yeah. So they've still got the full bike and run distances in. Taken out by Chris Lieferman of the USA in 3.23, TJ Tollickson in 3.24, and Matt Hansen in third in 3.25. If 
Yeah, it's big, like big pro field there with Michael Rayler and Joe Gamble's racing and Sam Appleton as well. So yeah. it's attracted a good field, hasn't it? Yeah, totally. Jenny Seymour of South Africa won the women's race in 3.49. An age group was actually second. Cecilia David Hayes of the USA uh, and then Jenny Hansen third. But if we're going on pros, then bring in Beth Shutt, who finished in 4.01. So, yeah, some big names there. Yeah, a bit unfortunate if you're racing that as a big race the end, this one gets cancelled because of uh, because of fog, I reckon. Gutted. Yeah. If if you're a, if you're not a swimmer, you'd be like, bring it on. And if you are a swimmer, you'd just be really annoyed, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Gutted. But, but no sign of fog over in Cabo 70.3 in Cozumel, huh? Uh, oh no, uh, yeah, Los Cabos, um, not Cozumel. Completely not the other Cozumel, end. Los, not Cozumel, oh. Los Cabos. Cabos is up in. Um, in Baca, California, so the big strip of Mexico that kind of runs down from the northwest, uh, and it's very much at the bottom of that extra little bit of land, whereas Cozumel's right over in the Caribbean. So Los Cabos is uh, yeah, yeah. beautiful, and it's where lots of spring breakers go to. <laughs> so oh, like is a- it really? Is it one of those like kind of party destination type places? Yes. So oh, it's nice. very much next year, Helen. End of season. <laughs> oh, seriously, it, it is one place I would genuinely love to go and do uh, a race. Um, you know, we say, "Oh, Helen, do you fancy China? Do you fancy there?" And I'm like, "Nee, nee." Yeah. Oscar boss, yes, get me out there. Do they have a full Ironman out there as well? Or was it just the 70.3 at the well, moment? I know previously they did, um, and they had it in March kind of time. And the first year, it definitely had pros. I'm sure last year it didn't have a pro field to it. So I don't know if then they've just switched it round. I'm not quite sure. But, yeah, this was definitely just a 70.3, and there were pros in it as well. Right, good. Good, good. So, come on, results. Talk me through it. Who's taking this one out? Yep. So, Mauricio Mendes of Mexico uh, won the men's race in 3.52. And he, um, didn't he get third at Xterra Worlds recently? Yes. Um, no, he won it. He won it. He won it. Sorry. Oh, really? Yeah. So he's having. You've a got good... such a good memory for this stuff, Hells. I'm impressed. No, he's having a very, very good season. Um, Match Rabo was second in 3:57, and then Cody Beals of Canada third in four hours and four seconds. Um, and then just again looking it through again, a strong field. Rob, Andy Potts, Richie Cunningham, Drew Scott. So they're Martin kind Jensen. of. Martin Jensen. Yeah. And oh, James Hadley down in tenth as well. Yeah. And then a great comeback win for Angela Nath on the women's side of things. Uh, nearly like a, a good, comfortable like eight-minute margin. So yeah. she raced Kona in 2015, but she has been injured since. So we haven't really seen anything of her, to be honest. So absolutely fantastic for her to come back and get that win. Uh, Leslie Smith of the USA was second in 4.27. And then Sue Hughes of Canada, third in 4.30. There you go. So there's our results done for this week, huh? Yes, yes, yes. Are you, yes. Uh, are you fired up to race? I did race, Rob. This weekend? Yeah, I did. Where did you race? I did a, I did a running race. Go on, tell I, us more. It was the uh, Halloween Hellraiser on Sunday. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, it was... Uh, kind of fairly local, so near Crewe, so up in the northwest. Okay, of how England. far was it? It was ten miles, multi-terrain. It wasn't particularly hilly, but my goodness, there were a lot of styles, and there were one or two bits. You you really did run through a graveyard. Oh wow! Hey, how um, nothing like easing yourself back into training with a with a ten-mile off-road race. Honestly, <laughs> I, I was in my element. I was loving it. Um, and I felt very fired up and um, I was there with two colleagues because we entered the corporate team and we went and won. Brilliant. <laughs> so Love we, it. We each got a bottle of, uh, of fizz and uh, so it was me and then two guys. I was super impressed with the guys. They came third and fourth in the men's oh, race. Brilliant. Where did you come in the ladies race? Third. Very good. Another yep. podium for Helen. Yep. It wasn't fourth. I was running so scared for like the last <laughs> four miles. I was like, I am not coming fourth. I'm not coming fourth. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, and the person who finished behind me, I don't think I've ever beaten her. So she does usually beat me a lot. 
Well, look at that. And you're at the end of your end of season break as well. So who knows what's ahead of you once you get yourself back in shape, huh? Well, no, none of that. But I was just delighted, Rob, to be able to run 10 miles without pain. Yeah, I bet. It was cool. I bet you were. It was really good. So, yeah, uh, South Cheshire Harriers put that race on and uh, it was very enjoyable. So if you're after a 10 mile, fairly flat off road kind of race, um, check it out for next year. Halloween Hellraiser. Nice stuff. All right, now on to our news from this week then, sponsored by Cheer Charge. Um, they're running a competition to win a box of Cheer Charge flapjacks. You can just still get in this week. So box worth £32 with mixed Cheer Charge flapjacks and those Karma bars as well. So head yourself over to cheercharge.co.uk forward slash blog forward slash cup of try. All you've got to do is enter your email address and you'll be entered into the free draw to win those yummy goodies. Hells, tell us some news this week. I know you've you've got a friend of yours has got something going on, haven't you? Uh, the I'm well. I can tell you. John McAvoy's book. I'm talking about. Sorry. Yeah, fine. Okay, so there's two things I'm going to tell you about. Number one is the fact that I did actually eat a cheer charge bar straight after that run, and it was blooming for for um, <laughs> a nice little sugar hit. I was like, yes, I need that. Uh, Thank you very anyway, much. so yeah, we've been running a competition on Twitter. Um, to win a copy of Redemption, which is John McAvoy's book. We had him on the show back in May. And uh, John was the former prisoner. He was in Belmarsh and um, just, yeah, big, big kind of in the criminal world. And he has absolutely turned his life around through sport. It's an amazing story. I'm going to put my hands up here, Rob. I have read the first page of this book. I haven't read more because I knew that I was going to be giving them away. So... Um, we ha- haven't read through it, but the first page is brilliant, and I have seen other people saying this book is amazing because it's only just come out. So the lucky winners are Joe Spraggins and Natalie Stevenson. So their names were drawn out randomly yesterday from all the entries we had. We were asking people to um, tell us what got them through a hard race. So this didn't determine if you won, but it was part of the entry. So Joe Spraggin said that knowing that however much I'm suffering, everyone else is hurting as much, if not more than me. So true. Yeah, isn't that just true? Isn't it? And then um, uh, Natalie said, in hard races, I remind myself of the journey I've been on to get to that day. And I look at the scenery and breathe it in. Nice. Love it. So we will be getting the book out, um, or the books out in the post this week. And that'd be dozy. Awesome. That's Rob, brilliant. Should we, should Thanks we very on? much, John, for giving us a couple of books to give away. And, and well done getting your book written and getting it out there. I'm uh, I'm excited to read it itself as well. Yeah, I have honestly. I've only heard good things, and it's such a good story. And I love chatting to him, so I guarantee it will be a good read. So yeah, get on it. Redemption. That's- Good interview that Hells. I uh, I was very inspired at the end of that one. So you, yeah. if you've not heard that, go back to the archives and check out his interview with Helen. It's uh, it's a good one for a long run, that isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Long run, just yeah, whack it on, and uh, you get it'll get you through it. <laughs> definitely get you through it. Um, <laughs> Rob, let's do um the interview of the week this week, which is with Lucy Gossage, and then after that we will do Coach's Couch. Cool. Fab. Okay, so here it is. Uh, this week's interview with the ninth place female finisher at Kona this year, the Duracell bunny herself, Lucy Gossage. Lucy Gossage, welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast. Hello. Hello. Oh my goodness. Right, Lucy, we need to clear one thing up straight away. I think there were rumours flying around that you were going to be retiring and I've seen somewhere you're like, no, I am not retiring. So what's happening? No, I'm not retiring, <laughs> basically, in a nutshell. Um, I am not done with triathlon at all. I love it too much. Um, but I am going back to work three days a week, uh, so it's going to be a bit different next year. Hopefully in a good way, not a bad way. <laughs> Surely in a good way, because you, I guess it's almost like you've kind of gone full circle. Yeah, and do you know, I when I, I thought about it quite a lot because I've obviously got mixed emotions about going back to work um, and some days I'm really excited and some days I'm thinking, what am I doing? Because it, it is going to mean I have to turn down opportunities that I get through triathlon. Um, you know, like going, I, I've been asked quite a lot to go and give out awards by tri-clubs and things and I'd love to say yes to them all but I just don't have time. 
Um, but I think when I when I went full time as a pro, the reason I did it was because I I, I never wanted to ask what if. And um, right now, if I don't go back to medicine, it, it's the stage of my career where if I don't go back now, then it will become very hard. It's not impossible, but it will become very hard to be a doctor in the long run. Um, certainly, the kind of doctor, you know, a, pro- a proper doctor. Um, so if I don't go back now, I think in five years' time I will look back and go, "What if? What would have happened if I had to?" So um, yeah, in, in you know, in it's mixed emotions, really mixed emotions. Um, but I, yeah, lots of things I'm looking forward to it about it. But um, pretty pretty nervous as well. It's been a long time. <laughs> what do you think you will miss the most about the? life of a pro triathlete when you do go back well it's only three days a week so i i mean I, i've done it before working three days a week racing pro i'm no i've raced pro when i was working full time but um in many ways it it will be it, it it might be a blessing in disguise because i i've had so many injuries this year like i can count on one hand the weeks that i've not been injured like quite literally i'm not exaggerating that at all um i've been a, a basically a biathlete i've been <laughs> I think three weeks of the year where I could do all three sports at once. So seriously. <laughs> so I, I I think as long as I can keep the balance right and um and and make sure I get enough rest and and do all the other things that are important like massage and stretching etc. Then I think it might be resting in skies, having a bit less time because I do find it quite hard resting. Um, but I I do I think it it will mean that I have to turn down. Some of the fun stuff, like going to try clubs and giving out the awards and things, that um, I would otherwise have been able to say yes to do. And do you um, uh, know that I was going to say, uh, Annabelle Luxford, she went back to work a bit, didn't she? Yeah, I like, I think it, it's harder being a full-time athlete than people realise. And, you know, we put on Twitter and Facebook all the glory days, but it it's tough. And particularly when you're injured and you're not quite sure when you're racing and day in day out doing the same thing um it's like there there are quite a lot of mornings when I swim with a club and I see everyone going to work and I I think actually I'd really like to be going into work um it yeah so it's harder than people realize and I think um I see a lot of pros who are just carrying on doing it because they've got nothing else to do and that's entirely the wrong reason for for being a pro triathlete and certainly for me that uh, it would just never be enough even if you're making a lot of money from it that would never be enough for me to do it um so yeah I don't know I don't know right now it's so stressful trying to sort everything out that I can't really see how the balance is going to come um but I think when I'm settled and I'm not trying to sort you know moving house and and everything and I'm I'm settled in the job and know what I'm doing again um I think it might turn out to be a good thing. Um, a little bit less training, a little more, more specificity, and perhaps make sure that I keep keep loving the training rather than getting stuck in a rut and just you know dragging myself through it. And in, in that <laughs> sense, you've obviously seen both sides of it. So in a way, you're at an advantage in that you know what it's like to mix both, and the fact that you do have something outside of triathlon. Yeah, I think I mean I think I've I've always done being a, an athlete or being a pro. I still I know it sounds stupid, but I still don't really think of myself as a proper pro. But you are. Uh, I'm telling you, you are. <laughs> but I don't I don't do it the way that other people do it. So I don't I don't have a coach. I don't have a manager or an agent. I don't do things by the book. Like I I kind of just make it up and train you know I, do, I don't know I do a Sufferfest DVD rather than doing a, a session on the turbo and it feels like I kind of just make it up but but for me that that's how it works and so and I think the collarbone showed me that actually different training approaches can still produce good results so that's given it actually given me a bit more confidence that I will manage to juggle the two so I think yeah you don't have to do you don't have to train 35 hours a week and if you're only training 25 hours a week you've got quite a lot of time to do other stuff um and it can get for me it can get a bit dull just watching netflix and sitting around not doing anything so <laughs> but I, who knows probably in three months time I'm like, i just want two hours to watch netflix <laughs> have you missed using your brain in an intellectual kind of way um I've not missed using my brain, I don't think. I've, I've missed being useful. Um, like, you're not very useful as a, as a pro triathlete in that 
you know, for some of the things that are useful, like I, sometimes I write a column for, or you know, for a magazine, I think, oh, that's quite a good column. I'm quite, you know, people enjoy reading that. They might learn something from that. And that's kind of satisfying. Or you go into a school or you, you know, I don't know, you do something that inspires. And, that, and that's, that's quite nice. But most of the time, it's not, it's not very, you just, it's not a very useful thing. It's all quite self-centered and um, yeah. it's fun. It's, you know, it's great, but it's fun. And I think I, I need something else in my life that is useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think you will, will you race less if you're going to be working three days a week? I've actually got a sneaky plan that if I can stay injury free, I'm going to race more, but I'm going to go at home. <laughs> because I, I love racing. And also, if you race, then you don't actually have to do any training because you can just race at the weekend, recover in the week, do another race. Um, and, and actually, you, like, I'm joking, but when I think about some of my best races, in running into Ironman UK this year, I raced every single weekend for about, I think, seven or eight weeks. Some of them were like, you know, not proper races, and I, you know, I did the relay at the outdoor half, but it was still a, it was a it was part of a race, and I ran two thirds of the run, and um, and some were more serious, but but that does work again. It's like I don't do things by the book, mm-hmm. and, and I kind of think if I'm going to do a hard session, I may as well do it with hundreds of other people and keep it fun, and that's what I've missed this year being injured because when you when you're injured, you can't really race. So <laughs> hopefully I'm going to train less, be injured less, do more racing at the weekend. Some will just be, you know, the local 10K or whatever. Some will be Armen UK and Wales and, and what have you. Um, yeah, but we'll see. This is all hypothetical. Who knows? <laughs> so let's go back a, a few weeks, Lucy. And um, the moment that you thought, your chances of even going to Kona were over. You, oh, your, your whole mind must have been all over the show. Yeah, I oh, I was um, I was in a hole. I mean, it had been it had been a tough summer anyway for for various kind of personal reasons and um, yeah, and then that happened and I'd, I think I'd, I'd done Arm UK and then I'd done Outdoors just as a bonus kind of, I was out there at the end and just had 10 days off and still a bit tired and yeah, and went out and ride, I probably shouldn't have done because I was too tired of um, what happened and I just I just remember thinking, this is it, this is this is triathlon, it's over, like, I'm going back to work, it's done, I can't do Kona, like I'm just going to fizzle out and I just... I just couldn't see a way around it. I couldn't see how I could get to Kona. And I, like, I, I'm quite a positive person. And no matter how hard I looked, I just I could not see a positive in the situation. Um, and yeah, it was it was horrible. It was it was and and to be you know no one could no one could see a positive really. And and whenever anyone said you know you might get there, it just seemed like it was so false. And it was. Uh, yeah, I was like, it's all very well being optimistic, but you've got to be realistic as well. And at the time, realistically, and you know, James, my orthopedic surgeon, or the guy that he's the, like the trainee doctor who organised the surgery, and the the surgeon and the physio, they were they were all like, well, you might get there, but realistically, you're not going to be competitive. And and so it was all very well people being optimistic, but I had to be realistic as well. Um, there would been it would have been naive to assume that I could get there in, in good shape. Obviously I surprised myself, but but actually at the time that would have been a, a false assumption, I think. Um, yeah. So when you were treading water, ready to start and the you know, the the um, cannons were about to fire, at that point did you in your mind were you still thinking, I really don't know what's gonna happen today or did you think, yeah, I can do this today and I can be competitive? Um, it's funny. I I was in I was in such a good psychological state when I got out to Kona. I think because the challenge was getting on the plane, or the challenge was getting to the stage that I got on the plane. Mm. Um, and I, I knew that I'd done absolutely everything I could do, and I've never been as proud of anything as the way I, I got myself out of that hole and, and got myself in a shape that I felt like I could go to Kona. Um, and I, I knew I wasn't in my best shape, but I also knew that I'd, I'd done absolutely everything I could do. Um, and so in a way, I just, I wasn't really thinking about how competitive I was going to be. I, I was just thinking, I want to execute 
a race that I'm proud of. And if I do that, I'll be happy. And I think actually that that really helped me because it meant I didn't panic when I was in like you know 25th on the bike and whatever 18th or whatever at the start of the run. I didn't I didn't try and chase people. I just I just knew that I was doing my race and I was executing a as good a race as I could. Um, and and so yeah, I knew that where, wherever I finished, I was going to be proud. Um, and and that's I don't think I've ever really felt like that before. It was yeah, it was it was kind of weird. The the position was almost it was almost completely irrelevant. And um, yeah, it's funny. I, yeah, I I was my my ex boyfriend used to canoe, and he always he always said um, he got a silver medal at the Olympics, and he was disappointed um, with that. He didn't do a good race, and he always said the the result was completely irrelevant. It didn't matter. All he wanted to do was do a run that he was proud of, and and I I think I. I kind of was in that state that it really didn't matter whether I came, where, whether I came twentieth or first. I was going to be, I knew I was going to be proud of that race, and I knew I'd done everything I could do. So the result was was almost irrelevant. And was that whole period by far the hardest sort of uh, the hardest time that you've had to come through in in a sporting, you know, in in your sporting life, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it's just a collarbone. But for me, it was more than that because I'm going back to work and I'm, I'm not planning on racing Kona next year. Um, so it was more than a collarbone. It was it was kind of the end of an era of being full time. Um, certainly for, you know, who knows, I might might have another period of being full time, but certainly imminently. And it, it was my last Kona. I'm not going to Kona next year. So it... Um, yeah, I can't, and I kind of the other thing was that I I've been I hadn't really performed this year, and I, I know I've had great results, but I'd, I'd I'd honestly had I'd had so many injuries, I'd been nowhere near my best at first for any of the races, and um, I kind of just felt like physically I wasn't injured running, and I just thought you know maybe this will be the race that I do myself justice, and um and so that was yeah I think that was, it was the timing and. I, yeah, like, I mean, one of my friends got paralysed two years ago in a bike crash. Not a triathlete, but um, one of, like she was a, a, the sporty girl at university. And I, I just, you know, I kept telling myself, at least it's just a collarbone. Like it, it could be something so much worse, but it didn't really help at the time. <laughs> you can tell yourself that, but it, it doesn't make it any better. But uh, yeah. yeah. And I've seen a photo um, of you on the finish line, and it is just full of emotion can you reflect on on those emotions yeah it's um yeah it's funny I'm, I'm actually i actually got tears in my eyes and I, I think I think um because I've been I've been so busy since I got back it just I haven't really processed it all yet um I, I literally I didn't think about work before Kona it was all just put in a box and as soon as I got on the plane coming home I had to open the box and and I think Kona's now in, a, in another box, and at some stage it needs to get opened and processed. But um, yeah, it was. I, yeah, I just couldn't. I, yeah, I was just so proud of myself. And ninth was, you know, that was an unexpected bonus. But the the fact that I got there and I'd, I'd got myself in, you know, fairly decent shape and had just come out of that psychological. <laughs> I just, yeah, I was just so proud of myself. And that will always. And and actually, the silver lining is that now of the collarbone is that now I will always have that sense of satisfaction and um you know who knows without the collarbone I could have been 15th I could have been fifth I don't know it doesn't really matter but coming you know a higher position without the collarbone would not be as rewarding as coming as years doing the race that I did with the collarbone so yeah <laughs> now I remember we we spoke before you were going pro and I remember you saying that um I think South Africa was the goal the goal at that point to try to kind of start you off on your on your uh, process of trying to qualify for Kona at that point did you ever think that you would come away with two top 10 finishes as a pro in in Kona I don't know what I thought then (laughs) I remember you thinking I don't even know if I'll get there I don't even know I'm not sure (laughs) I can't remember I just yeah I seem to bumble my way through and yeah um yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, obviously that year I, I got to Kona, but I walked the marathon, so that was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but 
But do you think you've achieved more than you had set out to achieve maybe as a professional? Um, I think the... Uh, like I said, and most people won't believe me, I still don't think of myself as a proper pro. I still kind of... And, I, and I, yeah, I, I'm getting... I've done some work with a psychology friend and um, I'm getting... You know, I, I know the facts are there, but deep down, I still, I still don't really believe it. But um, I think when I set out, I was I was genuinely doing it to see how good I could be and how much I could push myself and survive the challenges. And it's not been a, a smooth road. No, I don't think any pro traffic has a smooth road in terms of injuries and things. But um, but actually, I think that's that's almost that's part of being a pro. And and I'm. I'm glad I've had those experiences because they, you know, I, I think anyone can win a race, but it's how you cope when the chips are down that defines the the great from the could have been. And um, I think I'm I'm really proud of the way I've dealt with, you know, some shitty cards as well as some some great cards. Um, so in that sense, I I think I've achieved more than I ever could. The you know the wins and and things they kind of just pop of the process I guess I don't know <laughs> and what have you what have you loved most about the actually racing as a pro compared to racing as an age grouper um I guess, I mean, I've got to try I've done a lot of traveling I've, I've loved that side of it um I, I don't think it, the reason I fell in love with triathlon was the people you meet along the way and um I loved, you know, I, I got into it because I joined TFN in Nottingham and they were a bunch of pissheads and we used to go out to the pub and it was, you know, it was all brilliant fun. And in fact, they're the only people who be, who kind of know when I used to, when I tell everyone I used to be a pisshead, they actually know that I was. <laughs> These people, the Cambridge lot don't believe that. Um, but yeah, I think the people you meet along the way, and it's funny because I used to be very intimidated by the other pros, um, but now I, you know, they're there are very few pros that aren't friendly and welcoming and particularly with you know when when things are tough the collarbone and things it was it was amazing the support I got from them so um yeah I think I, I think that I think I've I've in I enjoy and and I hope I'm going to continue doing this I, I do like having a bit of a platform that I can start to do useful stuff with um mm -hmm. and that's one of the more rewarding things that that comes from having a little bit of a higher profile um and I don't know where that will lead in the long run, but, but you know, the, I think I've learned a lot as a in my in my kind of journey as a triathlete that I could do stuff with in the future. Um, so that's definitely an an unexpected bonus of um, of, of being a of being an athlete. Um, and it's funny actually because when I was asking for my sabbatical, I kind of told my bosses at work, um, "I'll learn so much more than swimming, bike, and run." And I thought I was just Going, I was just saying it really to to myself as much as to them to convince myself it wasn't a completely bonkers idea. But you, but you do, and I've had I've had so and I, and I will still continue to get them. So many opportunities that um and each time you you do a talk or you know something with a charity or whatever, then then it it leads on to something else. And um yeah, so that's been a, a really nice surprise that I have learned a huge amount along the way, other than swimming and biking and running. I haven't really learned how to swim, so. <laughs> <laughs> and will you be joining back up with the TFN lot when you go back to Nottingham? I hope so. I'm, I don't think I'll be in the pub quite as much. I don't think I'll have time <laughs> for the pub. But, um, yeah, I've still got some friends from there who are still, still, um, still around. So yeah, I imagine so. Did you get Lucy when when you were saying about you got advice from fellow pros? Was there one piece of advice in particular that actually really? had an impact on you um not specifically actually Yvonne Van Verken was really really good with practical tips about you know how you swim and and what you do and and kind of using the cross trainer and and stuff but um, like how do you swim with with a broken <laughs> collarbone like for the upper, I had eight I think I had eight days so you can't swim off the operation because obviously the star has to heal and everything um but before you can you can strap it to your arm, yeah. Like you can only wear a bikini because you can only wear clothes that you can dress into. But I got I jumped in, jumped in, like kind of sat on my bum and slid in, and then realised my bikini was about to come off, so I had to kind of start a lifeguard to do it. Up. So it was like you know a, a beach bikini with little tiny straps and then uh, yeah, strap your arm to one side, and and I did. I think I did three and a half k one day of single arm and kick. So 
Um, <laughs> <God. laughs> Were you like in agony after that? Uh, it was kicking off the side that hurts because you can feel the bones kind of it makes it all horrible the bones like <laughs> great together um, yeah and the, the rotation kind of oh, it makes you cringe thinking of it but um, it wasn't as bad as I thought actually I was quite surprised I kind of got in I was like yeah everyone's having a laugh she's uh, she's making it up but um, no you can so uh, yeah if you break your collarbone strap it to your side with a race belt good tip there you go so what <laughs> races do you think you will be doing um next year you said you're hoping to race quite a lot and uh quite a few in the uk as well what do you think what's the plan uh i'm definitely oh i really want to do ironman wales um that was to be honest that's that's one that i really wanted to do i wanted to do it every year it's just always cl- too close to kona um so so i want to do bolton and wales and they're going to be my two targets um and then Staffordshire um and then alongside that some probably some European 70.3s um and maybe some more of the local races I'll probably, so I'll probably do UK Wales and then possibly a bonus kind of Ironman after Wales just using the fitness that I hope I have if I'm not broken yeah um, and, and, that, and that would be with the aim then of qualifying for Kona again in 2018 yeah, yeah, that's the plan at the moment. Yeah, so so hopefully if if I did Wales and say Barcelona, that you know all being well, that should give me some nice points for for the next year, um, going towards the next year, um, and then yeah, who knows what will happen with work, whether I can negotiate another year off at some point, uh, you know, to go to Kona, that would be nice, but um, but we'll see. Cross that bridge when I get to it. Um, you must have some quite nice bosses, Lucy. <laughs> Well, you never know how much they listen to stuff like this or not. So, <laughs> yeah, very nice bosses. No, to be honest, I, like, I, I've been, yeah, I've been really, really lucky. I mean, they've, they've kept my job seven and a half years. So so I was in Nottingham working as a doctor, and then, then I moved to Cambridge to start my PhD, and, and I didn't enjoy my PhD, which is why I got good at triathlon, because I wasn't getting the job satisfaction. So I, I started to train rather than exercise. Um, so it's serendipity, um, but yeah, Nottingham did not have to. They they had to give me one year out. They didn't have to give me two and a half years out after my PhD. So they've um, they've been immensely patient, and yeah, I'm not sure they quite believe I'm actually going to turn up on Tuesday. But <laughs> they must have seen the colour me and been like, she's definitely not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually have a wardrobe of clothes, or have you just got lycra at the moment? Well, no, so I went home and, because I was, God, I was a lot bigger. So I went home to mum's yesterday where all my normal clothes, like doctor clothes are stored and tried some of them on and they were, they were pretty big. <laughs> Not wearable, like, <laughs> um, I think I could fit two of me in them now. So, um, yeah, at some point, well, I've only got three days, so I'm going to have to do it fairly quickly. <laughs> I'm going to have to go shopping. Um <laughs> Yeah, Sketches have said they're going to send me some shoes, so apparently they do work shoes as well as trainers. We'll see. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect for yeah. going on the ward rounds. <laughs> you see, I think Skinfit do some dresses. Maybe they could send me a dress. And... <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> yeah. And Lucy, I know um, last time you were on, um, I think Rob would have probably asked you for a top tip for other age groupers. Um, can we have a second top tip? Oh, well, I bet I said it. I bet I said it before, but it's key. <laughs> keep it fun. I don't know what I said last time. Um, you've got to keep it fun. Like, honestly, you see, see, you see, some some people who just don't enjoy it, and pros and age groupers, and you just got to say, why are you doing it if you don't enjoy it? And um, I, yeah, got to keep it fun, and, and 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 also don't be scared to do things differently. I don't, I don't think you need to do things the same way that everyone else does. Um, yeah, if you can come ninth in Kona the, with the the random exercising that I did that was just completely made up, depending on what I felt like, and you know, then then yeah, you can do stuff differently. So um, yeah, that's my tip. Keep it fun. I Perfect, think. Lucy. Congratulations on a phenomenal couple of years as a full time professional um, <laughs> triathlete, and best of luck with your return to work. Uh, and continuing as well as an Ironman triathlete.
<laughs> Thank you very much. I think I mean no, need more luck in the first bit, <laughs> certainly in the short <laughs> term. <laughs> So, Lucy, thank you so much for your time and we really hope that work has been okay this week and we look forward to uh, following how you get on next year and hopefully catch you up at some point again. Yeah, definitely. Good stuff. Right, shall we do Coach's Couch? Yes, let's do it. Um, right, so, Rob, uh, it, it, Coach's Pouch... Coach, coach's Pouch... Coach's Couch... <laughs> is sponsored by Team Oxygen Addict, isn't it? Um, it is. What's yeah, happening with... currently closed, um, but if you want more information, you can go to the website. It's team.oxygenaddict.com, and uh, if you just follow the link, you can add your email to an email list to uh, to be sort of notified when the team opens up again. It's going to be January before we're open for applications again, but get on there, check it out. There's some good free training information available that will help you guys out with your, with your winter training if you're not already being coached. So what have we got this week for the, the old coach's question, Hells? Well, talking of winter training, Matt Wackett on Twitter uh, sent us a question. You can too. We're at Cup of Try on Twitter. So do get in touch with us there. We, we like um, speaking to you, interacting with you. And Matt says, what's the verdict on keeping it steady, long-ish and consistent, i.e. no hard intervals until the new year? And that's winter running. Yeah, so... My my, um, I've, I've talked about this quite a lot, obviously on the show before. Um, my verdict is that I think if you're doing lots of hard work on the bike during the winter, the best way to keep yourself rolling along with the rest of your training is to take a big block of time and so like take two months to four months and just concentrate on making all your runs steady, enjoyable, aerobic, conversational pace. And the idea behind it is your heart and lungs are getting a really great workout on the bike, so you're going to be getting aerobically fitter that way. You don't have to, and you probably will benefit from not doing lots of hard and fast running, so you won't get sore legs, you won't pick up any niggles, because all you're doing is just bouncing along at an easy pace. The benefits of this are really twofold. Firstly, you'll probably get more overall training volume in terms of running in just by running along and not doing any fast stuff, because you won't pick up any niggles. And also, the real uh, the real drawback of doing some really hard running in the winter is you can make yourself really whipped all the time. You know, if you're trying to do hard sessions on the bike and hard sessions on the run, it's difficult to bounce back. So take a block of time. Just have your running be easy and steady and enjoyable while you do all the hard work on the bike. Now, a second part of Matt's question was, what about, like, the hard intervals and stuff? And there's a bit of a caveat here. I think for people who are racing long distance the advice i've just given there is is totally valid stay with that if you're going to be racing sprint to olympic next year people often say well look i can't go the whole winter without doing any fast running at all because i'm just going to lose the speed skills and there's a good point to that and i agree with it so i think it's worth taking one time a week when you're going to do some fast running strides and by that i mean doing you know runs of 50 meters to 80 meters a fast but controlled running so you've got a fast turnover with your feet you're up on your toes but you're not doing 200 meters 400 meters of reps it's not an interval session it's just a fast stride in terms of keeping your legs turning over quickly and biomechanically keeping your body running quickly so that when you do come time later on in the season after new year in january february to start adding in some faster running biomechanically you've still got that ability to run quickly um, so yeah, so just enjoy some steady winter running, everybody, and get your hard work done on the turbo. Don't do ten mile off road runs like Helen. <laughs> well, I think you know you make a good point there, and although we're talking in jest, I don't think there's a problem at all in going out and having a hard hit out once every two or three weeks. And if you're going to do that, if you want to go and do a running race, no problem at all. The caveat's going to be if you are going to do a running race, you're going to need to have some kind of weekly session in there that's got that faster leg turnover in because otherwise that's when you're going to pick up a niggle if you go straight from having done no really hard running at all to doing a you know a flat out 5k or 10k it's probably worth doing the week before going out and doing a little bit of faster running as part of one of your sessions so your body gets tuned in to running a little bit faster again but you know hells you've got a what five six year athletic history now of training day in day out sometimes two times a year so when an athlete's got that history, you're going to remember, your body's going to remember 
how to run fast without necessarily getting overly sore or overly niggly any of the time. And Rob, here's another, if if we're talking winter running, there's obviously quite a lot of cross country going on in the winter. Um, What about the differences between, you know, a a 5k cross country and the impact that that has on your legs and a 5k road race, for example? I, I know a lot of people love doing cross country and it's really, really fun. And I think that's totally fine. And I've taken some flack from people in the past for, for my view on running cross country races. I think the thing you've got to be careful of is if it's really wet and muddy and slippery and, you know, even if you are wearing appropriate footwear, my prime concern as a coach is doing training that's most specific to the goal that you've got during the year. Now, for some people, their goal is they just want to go out every other week and have fun with the mates and do races, and and that's totally valid. My concern is just that people don't pick up niggles when they're going out to do something fun. So if you want to go and do those races, totally fine. I think you've just got to be careful of the impact that running in, you know, the northern cross countries are pretty much ankle-deep mud the whole way around, aren't they? So you win on the roundabouts and you lose on the swing. So you're going to pick up some extra leg strength from running in all that sapping mud. But you've also got to be careful that you don't pick up any niggles or real soreness that carries on through that next week of training. Consistency is absolutely king through all of this. Great answer. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying keep your eyes on the bigger picture. (laughs) Loving it. Honestly, though, Rob, it was it was I, I think for the first time in so long on Sunday morning, I genuinely was so excited about the fact that I was going to be going and running and doing a race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's And I think there's a lot to be said for going out and doing stuff that inspires you and keeps you happy, especially during the winter months. Yeah. As long as the caveat is, as long as you don't do anything that damages yourself, it's that line that doctors use, isn't it? First, do no harm. Whatever you do, even if it's fun, if you're going to damage yourself by doing it, then in the long term, it isn't what's good for you. Yeah, very, very true. Very, very true. Love it. Um, Rob, have you been... Have right, you been... let's wrap it up. Yep, oh, cool. Oh, go on, sorry. No, I was going to say, have you been in the gym? Have you been back in the gym? I have, you know. I have. I've, I've got the weights out a couple of times this last week, just eased back in. I've had this, like, coldy, nasally, sore throat thing going on, so I've not, I've not managed to run or bike for an entire week, which isn't like me. I've had to have a complete week off. So I've just been doing a little bit of light weights just to try and stay sane a little bit. Um, it's all good fun. But I don't think I look quite like Arnold Schwarzenegger yet, Alan. It's all right. We've got a few years to work on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to order some human growth hormone, I think, before I look anything like a bodybuilder. <laughs> no, not, not allowing any of that. No, that that's a different category. We don't do that category. We're... Pff, no, n- none of that. Um, Rob, it's just going to say... Isn't it when you see these film stars that get caught at... These action film stars get caught at the airport with hundreds of vials of God knows what, and you think... <laughs> Well, okay, you need a super body to go and be in your film, but it's not exactly the best example to people, is it? No, no. <laughs> so we, we don't need to do any of that. I'm quite happy not being the most muscly person on the planet. And uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit of work to you know strengthen, all good, but I couldn't give a damn about not being the most muscly. Um, Rob, I was just going to say that next week we're going to have Jane Handsome on the show. Um, I spoke to her last Brilliant. week brilliant interview um but yeah that will be next week's interview so um yeah there you go and she was the winner of the of she won a race group at kona didn't she was the female 45 is that right she absolutely did yeah so we will look forward to playing that interview out next week yeah there's a few people have been asking for her actually the the couple of guys from team free speed highly recommended her as an interview so yeah i'm really looking forward to hearing that one But until then, Hells, thank you very much for your co-hosting as always. And thanks, everyone, for listening to us. Our sponsors have been sheercharge.co.uk, precisionhydration.com, and team.oxygenaddict.com. And thanks again to all our patrons. You've been listening to the Cup of Try Triathlon podcast. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And until next week, everybody, thanks very much for listening. Have a safe training and racing week, and we'll catch up with you again next week. Bye now. (laughs) 